your breakfast, kids. Croiso friends, welcome back to Opus L and I, where we still do Viking stuff. It's still June, which means that it's still Pride, which means that we're still doing queer stuff. Last video, I made a dress and a hood while talking about my own experience with queerness. I wanted to take a second and thank everyone who has been so lovely and supportive. It's been incredibly affirming and wonderful. In this video, I thought I'd take a second and talk about queerness in a more historical Viking context. The first thing that we need to keep in mind is our modern perspective. The way we understand queerness, gender, and even the act of sex is very different from the way that people in the past did. I could spend hours talking about Viking gender roles and the ways in which people transgressed them, and which of those ways was more socially accepted than others. It's a huge and nuanced topic. Instead, I'm going to touch on a few highlights that I think are important. One, the way we determine the gender of Viking burial finds is both by DNA typing and by making informed assumptions about the burial goods. Neither of these lenses gives us a full understanding since DNA can't always give a clear indication of sex due to hormonally intersex states, and our assumptions of gender roles based on grave goods and linked professions are always informed by our own preconceived notions and modern bias. Two, we can make some inferences about gender roles and transgression based on some of the writings we have from the late Viking period. In them, there are two insults, ergi and arger, that refer to someone as effeminate or unmanly, and arger in particular had an implication of being in the receptive role during sex. Those insults were serious enough that it was grounds for being challenged to a duel called homgang, where killing your accuser was your legal right. While it's not written explicitly that men engaged in homoerotic activity, the fact that these insults exist indicate that those kinds of relationships and encounters did take place. 3. It was also possible for women to step into male-dominated spheres in certain situations. Widows not only inherited money, but also the position as head of household or family clan until and unless she remarried. Burial finds at Birka, Sweden also seem to indicate that some women held military authority, although again, these finds conflate chromosomal sex with gender. And four, it's also important to note that all of these recorded social mores come from post-conversion Scandinavia. We have very little idea of how gender, sex, and transgression were seen in pre-Christian Viking culture. And I do want to end by reiterating that finding resonance with pre-modern queerness is incredibly valuable for the modern LGBTQIA community, and it helps push back against the image of Vikings created and upheld by white supremacy and toxic masculinity. The Vikings were an incredibly diverse people with a cosmopolitan, comparatively progressive, and nuanced society that deserves more than to be reduced to being the poster children for white fascists. For more easily accessible information about queer Vikings, I highly recommend Amy Jefford Franks' podcast, Vikings Are Gay, which can be found in just about every podcast aggregator out there. And I'll also put the link in the description box below. Okay, so let's talk about the actual project for this week's video. Like I said last time, my goal is to create a Viking kit that reflected the colors of the demisexual pride flag, but also could be easily integrated into my planned Viking capsule wardrobe. I do want to take a second and talk about my priorities when I create clothing for myself. I've talked about how my own personal goal is historically adequate. That means that I'm not generally sewing clothes on an experimental archaeology reconstruction level. I totally understand and applaud people whose joy is working at that level of reproduction, but that is not often my jam. I'm looking to create something that gives a reasonable silhouette, will not bankrupt me, and can be completed in a reasonable amount of time. And that last one is particularly important to me because, as you may have noticed, I release videos every two weeks. And if I'm doing a deep dive on reconstruction with original practice, including processing, spinning, weaving, and dyeing the fabric and thread, which is the only way to be as accurate as possible, I'd release maybe two videos a year. And if I did that, I'd miss you. <laughs> That said, I did really enjoy diving into the archaeological research with this project. 
So everyone go grab your cuppa. This week, in belated honor of Juneteenth, I am drinking Once Upon a Time by Fairy Tale Teas, a black-owned tea company with an amazing fantasy twist. This tea tastes like hazelnut and vanilla and is dusted with edible glitter because gays love to sparkle. But if that isn't your jam, you can get it and their other flavors pixie dust free as well, and I will make sure to link that down in the description. Let's get into it. In this video, I'm making an outfit based on a find from Kustrup, Denmark. The find consists of a dress made from linen, like the one I made in my last video, with a woolen overdress held in place with long loops over the shoulders secured at the front with domed brooches. This is a really interesting piece of archaeology because we have a fairly substantial piece of overdress fabric compared to some other burials, and the fabric treatment is pretty unique. The remaining apron dress fabric is about 9.8 inches by 3.5 inches, and it shows some very tiny cartridge pleating along the middle of the largest fragment. Unfortunately, because of the way that fabric degrades in soil, the bottom section of most apron dresses are all gone, leaving us to speculate on how they might have been constructed. Some people think they were simple tubes of fabric, some think they were more flared at the bottom with gores or shaped seams. I was mainly concerned with fabric conservation since they only had a limited amount of black wool to work with. My layout has a fitted torso and flared side seams and gores in the back for added swish. Since there will be gathers in the front, I didn't add any gores there, counting on the additional pleated fabric to add fullness to the front. The first order of business is sewing the pieces together, which is thankfully quick and easy compared to some other dresses I've made. Once that is done, I will take some time and fell the seams down. I'm not going to bother double folding them because I've already washed this wool so it's less prone to fraying. I just want to make sure that the seam allowances lay flat. After that is finished, I can start working on the gathers. Before I can start marking, I will fold the top edge over once and hem that so as not to create too much bulk at the top of the gathers. This is also how the Kustrup dress was hemmed at the top as well. The Kustra pleats are about 2 to 3 millimeters long and 3 millimeters wide, and the pleated section is about 3 inches wide. My pleats ended up being bigger, about 
five to six millimeters deep and three millimeters wide because in my test swatch, I found it hard to manipulate the fabric when the gathers were that small. The longest fragment we have of the pleated section is about 4.3 centimeters or 1.75 inches long, but we don't have any indication at all of how far down on the dress the pleated section went. I did some quick figuring and decided that I wanted the pleated section to end just below my chest at the empire waist level. I marked out a long grid measuring 6.5 inches from the top of the dress with horizontal lines every 3 quarter inch or so and vertical lines every quarter inch. And then I will run gathering stitches along every horizontal line at the intersection so that when I pull them tight, I will have very even, neat parallel pleats. In the Kustrup find, there isn't really evidence of how the pleats were made to stay in place. There isn't any indication in the archaeological reports to suggest any gathering thread, although that doesn't necessarily mean there isn't any, only that it could have degraded or be not visible without damaging the artifact. Some people have suggested gathering the fabric and then steaming it into place before removing that thread. In my experience with wool, I can't see this being a practical solution resulting in tightly packed pleats that stay in place over time. I chose to focus on the look and security of the gathers rather than experimenting with hidden pleating techniques. So after running 11 lines of silk buttonhole twist gathering threads and securing them into place, I used the tail ends of those threads to sew lines of tiny backstitches along each gathering thread, securing the pleats into place from the back. Next up, making the loops. The Kustrup loops are all between 1 and 1.4 centimeters wide and constructed in different ways. One has a linen core, one is folded over several times before being sewn shut, and one has the edges folded in like modern bias tape but is made from a different fabric than the main dress. For consistency and ease of construction, I've made all of my loops and straps the same way, like bias tape but cut on the straight. I've ironed the two sides of the long strips into the middle and I'm going to fold it in half, enclosing the raw edges inside and whip stitch it shut with black linen thread.
Now it's time to adjust the strap length on this dress. Because of the way that the straps are constructed, short loops in front and long loops in the back, they need to be adjusted from the back, which is difficult when I have to do my own fittings. So what I'll do is sew the short loops into place in the front because those won't change length, and then pin the back loops in place but not sew them down. As you can see, the straps are indeed too long, so I will put the brooches on the straps as if they are finished and then pull up one side of the strap until it is at the length that it should be in order to hold the dress together. And then I'm going to pin the two sides of the strap together, which gives me a loop where one side is longer than the other. Then I can take the dress off and adjust the straps in the back to be the same length before sewing them down. Then the only thing left to do is trim up the bottom edge of the dress into a nice curve and hem it. Again, this is all speculative since we have no idea how long apron dresses were or how they were hemmed. I've opted for a simple twice turned half inch hem felled in place with black linen thread from Burnley and Trowbridge. Stay tuned after this brief commercial break to see what other accessories I made to go with this dress. The tablet woven band from the Kustra Find is lovely, but a bit above my current skill level, and I don't quite have enough time to put in the practice to build that skill before this video is coming out. So instead, I found a tablet woven band from Mammon, Denmark, from about the same time that I feel confident that I can achieve. I am using my trusty silk thread from AO and Weaver in white and purple. As always, the link to that shop, which is brilliant, is in the description box below.
I've positioned all of my cards how they are supposed to be according to the weaving instructions I'm using, link in the description box below. I have two completely purple cards and two completely white cards on either edge, and these will form the purple and white border. The eight cards in the middle are threaded with two purple and two white strands each. The way that those purple and white threads are oriented relative to each other across all of the cards, and then the way that the cards are flipped and turned is what makes the pattern. I'm not going to get into a huge explanation of how tablet weaving works since this is just a smaller part of a larger project, but I do have plans to make at least one dedicated tablet weaving project wherein I will go into the technical things in more depth. Now that I have the tablet weaving done, I'm going to finish the ends by running them back and forth through my sewing machine and cutting the fringe as short as possible. The Kustrup dress is a bit unlike some other apron dress finds in that the trim is not sewn down to the top of the dress. Rather, it's sewn to the front loops and left to float above the top edge of the apron dress. I really like how this ends up looking. It doesn't obscure the pleats and adds a really interesting visual element. Many burial finds, including Kustrup, show beads scattered around the chest area. Some of them are worn as necklaces, some were bead festoons strung between the turtle brooches. I knew I wanted to make a pride-themed bead festoon, but I wasn't sure whether I wanted to continue the demisexual theme or go with bisexual or queer pride. In the end, I decided to go with a rainbow because it both encompasses the entire community and because queer is still the word that most correctly describes my own identity.
I'm using beading wire here, a thin flexible jewelry wire instead of silk thread because I think every Viking reenactor has known the abject horror of having their festoon thread snap and seeing all of their beads go every which way. And considering how many of these beads were given to me by dear friends and colleagues, that's the last thing I want happening. I'll enclose the ends of the wire in crimps and add jump rings to the ends. Well, friends, another successful project finished. Thank you all for your kind patience listening to me geeking out about two of my favorite things, queer history and historical clothing. <laughs> Thank you also for being such a wonderful community and supporting and uplifting the good we want to see in the world. 
I am so proud of our little corner of the internet where we have decided to take a stand on the side of the marginalized communities who deserve care and recognition. Just a couple of brief things before I sign off. I know I keep bringing this up, but COSI is just around the corner in August. We are going to be having a badge collecting game and private discord, as well as all of the videos, social media events, and panels that we had last year at COCOVID. Also, a little bit further out, I will be teaching at this year's second Tournament of Defense event in Bellevue, Texas in November. I'm really excited to be presenting in such august company as Matthew Nagy of The Modern Maker and others. I will be teaching two classes, one on gores, gussets, and godets, and the other on a very brief history of queerness in pre-enlightenment Europe. Pre-registration for this event will be closing less than a week after this video goes live, so if you are in the area, enjoy pre pre-enlightenment rapier fighting, or a material culture clack that includes some incredible instructors, and also me, taking place at an actual castle with an actual feast in the evening, check out the link in the description to pre-register as soon as possible. If you liked this video, be sure to like and subscribe, and maybe consider sharing to your favorite social media network. I upload every other Friday, and you can click the little bell if you like getting YouTube notifications. If you would like to find me on other social media, I am at Opus LNI everywhere, and I will put all of those links in the description box below, along with a link to my Ko-fi, which has exclusive content for donors, as well as my web shop if you would like to help support the channel a little bit more directly. Until next time, be kind, do the work, continue supporting marginalized people, and keep creating. Whew.